Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Mm-hmm. Hello, welcome to the ins and outs of competing and cosplay. My name is Thermal Cosplay. I started cosplaying in 2014. Since then, I've won several awards. I've been sponsored by the Blurblad Company. I've experimented with te- um, materials from uh, several <laughs> uh, Wonderflex World and Blurla and CosplaySupplies.com, and I've guested all around Arizona. So, just kind of gone crazy. <laughs> The name is Thermo Sidekick. Originally, I was just also Thermo Cosplay, but that was really confusing to a lot of people, so <laughs> I just took on that moniker instead, and uh, I just follow her around. And then she takes me to a little bunch of awesome places. Yeah. Uh, we, so like I said, I started in 2014. I think she started at the end of 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I specialize in mostly, uh, I like to do special effects makeup. I like to do um, build, scratch builds. I'm not very good at wig styling, but I try my darndest. <laughs> um, and uh, that's kind of my gig, and then for you. Uh, I am very much like, I'm so excited to be here. This is my first steampunk event, and I've always wanted to because I'm generally known as the Goodwill Goddess. Um, I love taking down objects and modifying them, and you know. Yep. She's sometimes a little more like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do this. Cool swap. So <laughs> that's what we can do. <laughs> Alright, so we'll start with kind of our agenda. We're going to go over character selection. If you're going to be competing in cosplay, why do you want to choose a certain character and what to consider when doing so? Um, talking about um, materials collection as well and when you should be starting that. <laughs> um, tracking your work in progress, why it's important to do so for competing. Then moving on into uh, just more about um, competing competition tips. Uh, group versus solo, what it was like regional, national, international, since I've actually been involved in all of those, and how it varies, and just kind of talk about categories, and we'll give you a lot of details. If you have a question, we have a rule that you raise a hand, we don't want you to wait. So raise a hand, and we'll let you ask, ask that question right away so you don't forget it, because I think it's terribly annoying when you have to wait till the end, and then you're like, what was I going to ask? I have no idea anymore. <laughs> All right, so choosing your character, the big things you want to think about is what motivates you to be that character. Is it something that you created? Are you, you know, using a reference, an existing character in media? Is it something other people would recognize? Are you okay with people seeing your character that you may have built and recognizing it as someone else? So think about stuff that motivates you and how you would feel if someone does or does not recognize you. Those are things that some people find hurtful and other people are like, yeah, it's okay, it's obscure. No, I did it for myself, it doesn't matter. So you want to think about your motivation. Um, you want to think about your stylization. Just because a character looks a certain way doesn't mean you have to keep them looking that way. Typically, if you want, for instance, this character is Todoroki from My Hero Academia, I'd still be out for it from a different character I do called Violet Evergarden, which is actually a scene of anime, and I put that wig on top just because I hate Violet's wig so much. It's so heavy, it's like three and a half pounds on my head, and I'm like, no, I don't want to wear that today. <laughs> so sometimes you can just swap things out. Um, typically, if you stick to either the same eye color, hair color, or some kind of color in the clothing that resembles that character, most people are going to recognize it. Yeah, color fades definitely yeah. help a lot. I mean, you can see like a million people that have done a thousand variants on uh, Sailor Moon, like you know, punk or Barbie or just anything. <laughs> yeah. And, and so stylization is another thing you want to consider and don't be afraid to modify too. Like I'm very tall and I'm very broad shouldered and so I usually have to modify a lot of looks to fit my physique as well. Um, skill set techniques. 
Uh, I'm going to actually go one more thing. Oh, choosing your character, though, because um, well, look, this is someone you're choosing your character. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, for me, uh, we've we've won a couple of awards, and yeah. the ones that I usually am in the group for, we end up winning on performance. Um, and one of the things that I found for winning in performance is choosing a character that you just enjoy being. And I know that sounds kind of obvious, but um, you know, I make some cosplays, and they're sort of serious characters, or they're kind of like withdrawn, and I find I don't end up wearing those cosplays very often, and it's a little trickier for me, um, but the characters that are closer to my personality type or that I enjoy portraying that personality type, it's so much easier for me to act that out so go on stage, on stage yeah. and that's usually where we end up you know, having more luck. Is yeah, and we talk more about groups later, too, mm -hmm. and how what the impact is when joining a group that you may not have thought about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, those are like really good points. Um, but we're also leading into that is like uh, personality too. You want to think about like what skills do you have, um, and is this something if you're making this character, you're absolutely going to make it. Can you build it? And if you can't build it, can you thrift it? If you can't thrift it, are you going to need to commission somebody? Are you going to need to learn? Do you have the tools? There's so much to consider there as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, buying versus making, which we just kind of refer right in there. Um, finally, there's budget versus quality. So say you really want to be that character, it's three days from the event. You're probably going to go more for budget than quality at that point, and you're going to go hit the Goodwill or thrift store or something that you can put together, and then maybe order a wig or contacts that can be brushed that fit the character exactly. So you have some that's very poignantly that character, but then the rest of it is, um, hey, I threw this together because I really enjoy the concept. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found, I mean, we've been to a lot of cons, and the rules between cons can vary wildly um, yeah. as far as what percentage of your cosplay needs, or your costume or anything, needs to be handmade versus purchased and modified versus so there's just a big difference between the masquerades, contests, skits, and um, fashion shows. They all vary in what needs to be yeah. done. Because some of them, you could have purchased a costume and made zero of it and go up and make, do a really good performance and still win. And other ones, like if you did not make almost every single stitch that exists on there, then you're disqualified from it. Yeah, I mean, one example so would be like in World City Comic Con has the national championships of cosplay, and you have to have 85% of it made. Um, you can use found objects that you have to completely repurpose them into something that they weren't before. Mm -hmm. um, and even then, they do a lot of pre screening, and even after you, after the pre screening, there's still people that get knocked off the day of if they found they didn't meet the quality of expectation for stage. Mm -hmm. So it, some competitions are pretty aggressive. <laughs> yeah, so the number one thing I would do is like, you know, read the rules of that particular, even if you've done it before, some years they change their, their things, like they'll make it more difficult or easier. Just really make sure to read those rules, see how much it has to be, um, should be you know, handmade versus purchase versus, you know, modified. It doesn't want to show the previous one. Okay, well, we're just going to look at that and then we'll go to the next one. Okay. Um, so you can look back here. Apparently my phone doesn't actually show it. But um, so these are characters that we've chosen. Um, the one in the middle that has the white hair with the purple um, outfit and the white gloves is a character named Azra. It's a mobile game that I played and I loved the character. He was um, Middle Eastern, had an amazing personality, was really interesting. And I decided that I wanted to cosplay him to show people that you do not have to change your skin tone to be a character. Because it's a very big thing right now in competitions. You will get disqualified if you change your skin tone, unless it's like an alien skin tone or something that is not humanoid. Um, simply because they want to be diverse, they want to be accepting, but they don't want you to change your tones in competitions to match that of a human one and, and disrespect somebody else. So I was just showing some of our younger generation that kept asking me questions, well, I need a tan. Well, you don't. You can still represent the character no matter what your skin or hair texture is. It's okay. And so um, that was why I chose that one. I also liked how like he was sassy sometimes. <laughs> so, but you have Raven too. Uh, yeah. Usually, I actually go for more boisterous, loud characters. So it's funny that like the two characters that are not boisterous and loud are the ones that I have up there and have one with. But um, I think we, well, maybe. Uh, let me know, you guys maybe raise your hand, if you sometimes put on a costume and you're like, I immediately know who I am, what accent I have, and my entire backstory as soon as I put this on. And then other times you're like, yeah, this is okay. You know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm in costume, I can go. 
not. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like sometimes there's just something that clicks. That's the one at the very end, yeah. where, like, the, the, the very tall elf next to the very short elf. That's a Piero test and, and um, a D-Lit from Record for Lotus War. The only reason that wore Piero test is because D-Lit wanted a Piero test. I was like, oh my god, I'm going to have to wear pasties and all these crazy dance tights, and it is 32 degrees in, in Seattle right now. I'm going to die. But I did it because she really, really wanted a Piero test, and none of her friend group would ever do it for her. And I'm like, I knew I could make it in seven days. And so I put that all together, but uh, I, uh, after making it, handed it off to a friend who modified it, and now she wears it because I was like, that was a one and one scenario. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being comfortable in it too, obviously, and not just comfortable like, uh, you know, costumes are generally not actually all that comfortable, but feeling confident in it is it's very important. Like, it comes across in your performance. It comes across even when you're talking about the costume yeah. itself to the judges. Yeah, and that's that's the thing too is the more confident you are in your costume. And say you are doing a group like we did a group of the Magic Night Group, which is the very first image. And I wasn't overly confident in the character I chose just because this specific stylization of her had her incredibly busty. So I had to wear drag queen boots to make her look incredibly busty, and it made me very self-conscious because of how much it was exposed. Um, but over the day, my friends, we, we made so many jokes, we laughed about it. One of the judges was so amazed at the quality of the boots that he wanted to buy some for himself so he could be a female character one day. And he chased me out of the judging room because he forgot to ask where I bought them from. So over time, I got it, it like eased into it, and then I realized, you know, this is actually I think the artist kind of did it because it's funny because she's like the more shy, quiet character, and then she made her look like her outfit was very loud and flamboyant, and so it was kind of like taking out the strength of her character but putting it into mm -hmm. the garment. And when I kind of locked in with that, I felt a lot more comfortable. And I apologize that I kind of flew around all over the place, but um, okay. uh, I definitely think. When you're talking to the judges, I try to treat it like an interview, which is like, this is the one time that rather than being humble and trying to, you know, whatever, you're like, no, I am awesome. Let me show you how awesome I am. And like showing them, and again, it's, it's not about having a big ego. It's just like, I'm really proud of myself. Like, look what I did. This is pretty cool. Like, I did this. Awesome. Um, you just really want to, you know, like be able to give your full self to really show off your costume. Yep, no, I agree. Um, so we'll kind of move forward because we've got quite a few slides here. So we talked about like choosing your materials. And so there is an app currently by Cosgear. Cosgear makes cosplay tails and ears that move and they're starting to make more and more products. Um, they have this cool thing called a cute band that you can put underneath your wig that has magnets in it so you can magnetize whatever objects you want to your wig and no one's gonna see it's attached there. Really awesome. They also have one that's a felt band instead of wearing a metal headband. They have all these really cool ideas. They're based out of, I believe it was Sweden when I actually had an interview with them. And they, they actually reach out to um, cosplayers around the world and interview them and ask, what it is you're looking for? What would you want to see in an app? What would you want to see for sale? What is the market missing? So they're out there even contacting existing people and costumers to see what it is that their needs are and what's not being met. Um, and they created this amazing app. It's completely free. Uh, it can be accessed on phone or just on a, uh, through a desktop or a laptop, whatever you want. And uh, it has photos, you can add conventions, you can add, I, I added all of my costume like my materials, and underneath the material, like underneath the pieces like chest armor, I have to 3D print this, I have to sand this, I have to paint this, so I'm building out a whole list of things that I can track. And you can either put a checkbox saying it's complete, or you can do a percentage dial. And so it's really cool to track your own progress and kind of give yourself a little pat on the back when you're doing something really good and knowing that you're going to meet that competition deadline. <laughs> um, and uh, another thing that that's really good for as you check those off, it's a good reminder for me to take progress photos because I'm really bad at forgetting to take progress photos, but when I have like, when I break it down into little tiny bite-sized chunks that I can check off mm -hmm. on the app, then I'm like, oh, well, I should take at least the beginning photo of the next thing I'm going to do. Yeah, um, and, and then a lot of pattern monitors. It because is. Judges have a notes section in there too, so you can um, add more. So if you did a new technique and you couldn't remember what website or what video taught you how to do that, just toss them in there. I use this book to do this, or I use this site, or this link in. So you'll have that forever. You can even download it as a PDF if you don't want to keep it online and track it that way too. Um, but the things you want to consider when you are collecting materials, number one is obviously your budget. Like, 
how much can you spend on materials? So that's going to determine where you need to go for them. Um, and then the next one is accessibility. I will be honest, this is, even though like costuming and cosplay is becoming more prevalent, it's still a problem. Accessibility is an issue, especially with the supply chain issues we've had since the pandemic, right? So you will need to add more shipping times, which means can I make that competition deadline or am I maybe going to have to go with a different material because I just, I can't get in here. Um, or is there a way that I can engineer it to look like that material, right? Could I add latex to it or glue or glitter or just something to look similar in the interim until my existing comes back? Uh, so those are things you want to consider. Uh, accessibility should be times, curing times too. Um, Arizona, we don't typically have that big of a problem. It's really warm here. So, but when I went to Seattle, I helped a friend, and oh my gosh, that was wild. It took three days for paint to dry, like just acrylic paint, not even spray paint, just acrylic paint. Three days, and I just looked at her and I'm like, "You poor thing. No wonder you have to start six months in advance." But then they like super glue things with impunity, and like this like, cheap as crap. I'm jealous. Crap glue, like hot glue. I saw some people say Lucy got her entire costume with hot glue in it. I'm like, what is this? Like, <laughs> that's a false part. <laughs> is, is, you're not going to be naked by the end of the day? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and that's another thing too. Some of the competitions, depending on, we'll talk about more of it later, but if you're in state or out of state, some of them, they, they are like hot gluing here. People would just judge those little bitch and be like, no. They're going to actually maybe think you're joking. Um, but in other states, that's amazing. It's a perfectly fine tool to use. So you might actually even be judged differently on the materials you use depending on where you're going to compete. Um, so that's, you want to really consider that. Um, safety, please use masks and gloves and goggles and everything. I've seen too many people kill animals because they were eating a foam in a room that wasn't ventilated or um, they used resin and dropped it on their skin and now they have a permanent scar, not realizing that you know it gets hot enough to burn through your skin and muscle and bone, if it's, depending on what type of resin it is. I mean, my brother has permanent damage to his large toe because he didn't notice that his UV curing resin dropped on his foot because he thought he had a sock on. Well, he didn't have a sock on. Apparently, it was just a little piece of fuzz from his garage that landed on his foot and made it warm. <laughs> And then it ate through the fuzz, and I mean, he it took six months for his toenail to recover, um, and he still has like this really nasty stuck scar. So please be safe. Like please, please, please invest in those safety tools. And best way to compete is not dying first. Yes, there you go. <laughs> that needs to be on a T-shirt. That, that needs to be a button. <laughs> yeah, like button, just something to wear. Like judges should be wearing that right there. Like, did you you came here live? <laughs> Let me shake your hand. <laughs> Uh, crafting space too, right? You may not have a dedicated crafting space, so when while you're crafting, what do you need to do while things are curing or changing? Can you put it aside? Is there somewhere safe? Do you have animals or children? Or do you have people in your home that have special needs that you need to stay away from something that might not be secure? So make sure you consider those things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, are you going to need to research? Sometimes you have to research. Sometimes finding that reference takes a lot longer than you expect. Like, I found one character I really liked, but the character never had a turnaround, so then I had to build my own 3D model, add all the clothing to it, and create more turnaround. <laughs> that, was, that was dedication right there. <laughs> and finally, it's, are you going to take the time to build a mock-up, or are you more confident in yourself and you feel like you can just go straight to your measurements and using your dress form? Or is all of that just foreign to you and you need to use bot patterns? Um, I can't use bot patterns. You can't, except we just have to make well, the hips a little wider. So my cheaper way of doing it, because I'm lazy and uh, my sewing skills are clever, not lazy, just clever. <laughs> not the best. Um, I actually feel way more confident going and buying something from Goodwill, seeing that it fits me, seam ripping it, which I know this sounds like way over the top, but I'll, I'll buy it, I'll seam it, make sure it fits exactly the way I want to, and then seam rip it and use that as my pattern because then I know for sure it fits me exactly. And that's the way why I'm too is getting thrifted objects. Plus, the cool thing about that is they store better and you can just iron and seam them. I don't know if you've ever used paper patterns, but yeah. they fall apart. And unless you transfer them to muslin or butcher paper, you're just dead within that first I have a pair of pants that I've used as a pattern for like four or five costumes. They just stay like they're permanently just mm -hmm. broken apart, and all those pieces are sitting in the drawer because I'm like, 
these that eat away our land. So we're talking about work in progress, so may as well move on to work in progress, because we're kind of moving, we referenced it earlier, but now we're talking about like, hey, we've built mock-ups and we've done all these things. You really want to track your work in progress. If you go into judging in any level of competition, even if you don't have to have a lot made, if you go in there and you just show one or two pictures, they're going to think someone else made it for you or you bought it. They're not going to think that you actually did anything to it. So even if you are just walking around thrift stores, just the process of like taking a picture of the clothing rack, showing what you got, showing that you had to style this, even a lot of fashion shows and some competitions that don't require as much made are happy to see all the work that went into it. The fact that you had to drive somewhere else or maybe you had to do hours of research to find the perfect website. Showing them their progress is really important. Plus judges like to learn too and they like to see what their competitors are referencing. Yeah, I did a whole tiny Tina that was from the thrift shop other than um, like her apron. But I took a lot of pictures of like, I'd get her overalls and cut a leg and I had to like cut it kind of janky to make it look like it was torn I mean, off. basically by the time she bought this, it was not what, like when she <laughs> came in, I'm like, wait, I thought you just bought overalls, pants, and that's <laughs> not what you bought. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I took pictures of that and then there were a couple things, like she had a little bunny logo, so I like took some pictures of me like making the logo and painting it on and like, you know, just kind of putting it together with the places where I pinned it to hem it before I hemmed it, stuff like that. Well, so. I like using work in progress photos because not only it be important for judges, I have done some very bizarre techniques before, and if I had not recorded or taken photos, I wouldn't remember how to do them the second time because they were so tedious. Um, I use very specialized resins. I use some really unusual thermal plastics, and sometimes I'm like, wait, how did I manage to get it? Because I've had people ask me how. How come your thermal plastic doesn't melt in the summer sun? Uh, I gotta look and see how many layers of fabric glue I do, but I use fabric glue on my thermal plastics. Keeps it flexible, keeps it safe, and it protects it from heat. <laughs> um, and then also fabric glue, glue in my opinion, well, wood glue works good glue over time. Well, it can be sanded, so it, it will kind of it's not shatter, it just starts flaking off a bit over time. Fabric glue doesn't shift after. You just water it down a little bit and paint it on pretty much anything. It's like, ah, I have to live here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I found it to be really useful for armor and other stuff. And um, I even started, when I started judging, I started telling other people about it who, who were struggling figuring out how to seal their armor. I'm like, hey, here's this tip. <laughs> so work in progress is useful for pretty much everyone. And then also you can share it online. I'm a part of the Instructables community. They love seeing tutorials with tons of photos. Videos are good, but think about it. Sometimes you get really irritated with a video. It's like 30 minutes long, and you just want two specific points. If you have a written uh, tutorial with a couple videos in it, they can reference directly just that area that they want. So it's got lots of uses. And the thing I haven't done yet, but I've strongly considered, because again, I'm bad at taking work in progress pictures, um, a lot of phones have a lot more like camera features these days. Um, and a lot of phones these days actually have the setting where you can have it do kind of like a time lapse where it takes a picture once every I set mine up minute just or something like that. So you just put it up and just so have it keep taking pictures of you. So you have that video and then if you want to just take a particular frame out and that's, there's your picture yeah. or you can just show them that time lapse of like, you know, Rather than watching me for the whole 50 hours it takes me to build this, here's like a 10 minute video. And we all know that when we get involved with crafting or stylizing or collecting, we will get so just this is what we're focused on, we forget to actually collect things. So the zone is a dangerous place. So having some technology to help with the zone is great. <laughs> um, you can even use, like, even if you don't have a phone, there's still like a lot of even older cameras, because I've worked with manual cameras for like, over three decades now. Um, and they have timers on them, and you can just, once it clicks, you just go to click it back again. And it, they have, I've had a, a phone uh, or a camera that had like, I think it was a 30 minute lapse, and it will take a photo every 30 minutes. So I just made an egg timer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, egg timers work. I have used egg timers before. Oh, this is my time to take photos. Cool. <laughs> All right, so we're kind of moving into things to consider when you're competing solo. So before we move into the, the actual competition phase, were there any questions about all the other stuff that we I didn't think so. I'm like, no one raised their hand, so we're going to just keep going. Um, because I have 16 slides and we're almost 30 minutes in. What the heck? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So I have competed solo 
my biggest awards have been me competing solo. Um, I won an advanced award with Thane Creos, which is the crazy looking alien. I made that mask out of silicone myself. I've never used platinum cure silicone. I spilled it with monster clay. I learned that you can't with platinum cure silicone use a soft mold, so you have to create a hard mold only to cast in, which means I either had to buy a bunch of resin or I had to use a new material called urofil to thicken the resin and make it a much sturdier um, cast. And so I had to learn all these crazy things and it was it was insane. So like they actually bumped me. I entered this journeyman and they bumped me to advanced because it was a smaller event, made sense, but they were like, no, you're winning first in advance. I'm like, what? <laughs> Wait, but I haven't even won a journeyman award. <laughs> like, what are you talking? I've only won two and I am scared. <laughs> so that was, but, but we make a joke that when I put my mind to something, it gets done. I'm one of those people that I will just go to the max. So that's yeah. why I'm a psychic. <laughs> it took me 14 hours to make that mask between sculpting, sculpting, creating a, a hard shell mold, casting, and then uh, pulling the cast out, trimming it, and painting it. So. 14 hours total is not too bad for a full silicone mask going down my neck. Uh, but I remember because uh, we were talking to the judges after, and one of the things that they said, like why they picked yours, was not just the mask. It was the fact that the mask was so well done, but then also so was the costume. I like I, the sewing. I, I, the I lines learned how to sew from University, you know, like, and a, one little sewing book I found. <laughs> so it was, you know, like. There were multiple elements. It, it, it seems like cosplay competitions yeah. used to be just like whatever the biggest thing is on well, stage. And, and that's this is, what wins. And I'm so glad that that's kind they of bumped me too. The judges to be phasing out a little bit. Yeah, it's awesome. But. Well, the judges they also noticed too, and I didn't even think about this, right? As a competitor, I this did not run through my head. It does now that I judge. But I had both stretch and non-stretch materials, and you can't tell. So not like half of that material isn't stretchy at all but it looks like it's stretchy. And it's because I learned how to manipulate the fabric so that it would fit and contour to me perfectly. I had to do a few mock-ups to make that work. But I figured it out and I mean, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, I didn't even think that'd be something you guys would look at. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, okay, well I'm gonna make sure I consider that. I'm more of a stretch fabric girl, like I adore stretchy fabrics. I adore the fabrics that most people hate. Um, I can make stretch fabric do things that look impossible. Uh, but, like standard cottons and stuff, I'm like, I'm scared. And the second, I am um, Yojimbo, which is a video game, I actually placed um, second in journeyman at LA Comic Con, which was a national championship. I had no chance. I was like, no. When I saw the backstage, I'm like, I'm just going to talk to all these people in the green room. This is amazing. I'm going to learn stuff from them. There's no way. And then I got called second and I was like, I stood there like an idiot for a couple seconds in the back, which is like when they call the words, that's why there's like a big break. Because I'm standing there like a moron. And they're like, they called you what? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, be, so be, 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 surpri- uh, be prepared for shell shock. It will happen. Uh, and then finally, the last one was just a judge's award, which I mentioned earlier, that character. I wanted to show people. and. Uh, the, one of the judges was a person of color, and she was like, thank you so much, because I've seen so many people cosplay him and get really dark hands, and you were the first person who didn't do that. I was like, well, I, don't, I like the character, not his skin tone, like, I don't have to focus on that. So, that was what was really important there, but make sure the big things you want to think about. That silicone mask, could not see the first time I did it until I learned how to change the venting for the mask. Um, so I had to have a hand I had to have someone with me. Uh, even with my venting, there was still, I had like limited vision, right? Um, and because of the way the nose came out, I, it was like, eh, we're buffy. Um, and it was really easy to walk around in, but I needed more water breaks because my skin couldn't breathe as much. I was using alcohol paint. I had limited uh, visibility. And at the end of the day, when I took the mask off, because it's silicone and it keeps all of the sweat and moisture in it, you need two people on the sides of your face with like towels to collect the water that comes out. <laughs> I mean, it, it was funny. So these are, was, yeah, yeah, these are things you want to consider when wearing large costumes or competing alone. Will you need help? Can you use the bathroom? How can you eat? If you can't eat, can you have protein shakes and smoothies through a straw? Consider all of these things. When I was wearing white, I actually had someone comment on that today. You're wearing white to a desert plant. Yeah, I don't know. I just seem to like not. I didn't get to my car earlier today and I don't have any dust on me. I have no idea how. I think 
my fandom is going to be the 1800s. I made a joke, but I'm a lizard who doesn't scare me. Um, but sometimes you become more aware of certain garments, and so you unconsciously, after having worn costumes for so long when you're competing, there are certain things that you don't do. Like when I knew I had to kneel on stage, I actually never put my knee on the ground. I was kind of in this half uh, squat, like a lunge position. No one could see it. It looked like I was on the ground, but I didn't touch the ground because I knew there were a lot of feet that had been on the floor. <laughs> so there are just things that you may or may not unconsciously consider, but start to be more mindful of when you're competing solo as well. Yeah, and, and speaking of like costumes and handlers and all that kind of stuff, because generally the one that you're, you want to compete in is like the big yeah. one. Yeah, Yojibo, that, that costume in the middle well. weighs about 12 pounds when everything's on. So, I don't know if you guys have the same situation, but I know I very frequently have people like, oh, I've always wanted to go to a Comic-Con, or I've always wanted to do that. That's the perfect time to invite them to come yep. and say, hey, would you mind being my handler? Okay, all this means is you hang out with me, you make sure I drink, and you make sure I eat. And then, you know, and that's a very easy way to get a handler that would be dedicated to you because they're not into costumes very much yet, or, you know, they're, they're kind of getting their sea legs, and that's also a really cool way to show them. Well, and sometimes there are new cosplayers who want to cosplay, but they're scared, and having a more experienced person with them mm -hmm. makes them feel more comfortable. So you're also kind of like, you're, like, you, you, you're taking in, and you, you become a mentor for your new costume, and you're like, come little child, I should teach you the ways. <laughs> so competing solo, I always recommend at least one person be present with you, um, especially when you're like having to pose for backstage photos, which happens very commonly um, when you're competing. And you need someone to hold the bag that you've been carrying all day long. So, also, if you're competing solo, I very much recommend that you bring a change of shoes. At the end of the day, you will take because they're always at the end of the day, so you're yeah. walking around all day. Yeah, that's a, that's another thing is competitions are very rarely in the middle of the day. They're usually at eight o'clock at night, um, seven or eight o'clock at night. So, if you're going to compete and you don't get judged in the morning, maybe wait to put your costume on until later in the day. Now, competing in groups is a whole week. I think it's a really great place to start, though, yes. especially if you're concerned about stage fright or something like that, because, you know, I, I think everything's easier when you're doing it with other people. But the big thing, the, 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 one of the biggest things I hear when we're competing in groups is, well, I didn't want to be that character. I wanted to be someone else. So typically, I'm the one that's leading a lot of groups. So if I hear that from someone, I take the character, they're not interested. I invited them to this group, they were interested, they had someone locked in. Okay, well would you be my character instead? Do you like them better? Yes. Okay, take my character and then we'll do this. And sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you have to go between two people and negotiate and see who's willing to compromise. And there have been moments where like, well then we're going to have two of this character and we're going to make a joke about how they got duplicated, right? We're gonna yeah, he's like a Spider-Man Yeah, we're going to do something on stage and they just create each other and they just gal and then move on, right? So you can integrate it into your performance as well. Um, but there are there are more people involved, so there's going to be little tips, and there's going to be people who can't make build party days, there are going to be individuals who don't take as many work of progress photos, so you'll need to really be aware of who you incorporate in your group. Also, your group competes at whatever level the highest individual in the group is. No exceptions. <laughs> I haven't found a single place that makes an exception for this. So if you happen to have just one person in your group that's master level, but the rest of you are not, guess what? You're competing at master. Mm -hmm. And so typically when that happens, we rely on that master level competitor to give us advice to up our game to meet their level. And generally when it comes to, again, they'll kind of look at the, the rules of that particular one, but when it comes to most costume contests, as long as someone in the group is the one who made that costume, that is okay. So if you have somebody, that you know that you want to compete with, but who is sewing impaired, like mm -hmm. um, then if they make the costume for you or you make the costume for them, that that's okay because somebody yeah. in the group and made, they made the it, costume. Yeah. We had we knew a friend that I think Liz made like all of the five. Yeah, well we uh, did we did a Fushigi Yuki anime costume in 2022 January, and I pretty much made three quarters of the costumes in there. Um, because I knew that two of the people who we were inviting had never even been on stage. And so I made their costumes for them to take the ease, ease off of it. But I had them come in with me and like, you're going to be painting this. You're going to be doing this. So I gave them things that I figured you don't need much knowledge to perform. And they were pretty happy to be involved. Um, 
my sister learned how to tailor. She didn't realize how simple it can be. Uh, my other friend didn't know that an elastic waistband isn't that intimidating. <laughs> so like, you get a safety pin, you start feeding that elastic through, through. she's like, oh, well, I don't, no wonder I couldn't get it through. I'm like, what were you trying to feed it through with before? <laughs> what are you doing? Um, well, there's all, all sorts of tips and tricks that you can show people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually the number one reason I would encourage anybody to compete. Like, if you're just curious, but you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm really going to compete, like, do it. Do it if you never want to win anything, because some of my very favorite con and cosplay experiences have been in that green room. I've never gone to a con where anybody, uh, I mean, every once in a while there's just, like, two people that have drama with each other. Very rare, and generally speaking, the green room is pretty much, oh my god, I love that, how did you make it? Oh my gosh, this is so cool. And then like people being like, look, this comes off like this. And like you just spend the whole time it's learning over experience. each other's costumes and learning new techniques and just having like like that green room experience. Like if you see really just go there and talk to huge other people, group, it's so cool. That really huge group down at the bottom, that's D23. I got accepted to compete at D23 with a group of people. Wow. And in D23, they typically do not allow solo performances. You have to have two to three people minimum because it's such a hard competition to get into. <laughs> uh, but that's how many people were in the competition. And that's how many people fit in a room where we're just chatting up about how we need things. So it was really fun, especially since D23 so is international and there were just people from all over the world today. So it was really fun. Um, we also, one thing you want to consider is sometimes people get sick. So we had um, in our, our, our group up here with all the little Eevees, like all the little characters that look like they're from Dungeons and Dragons, but made them to creatures. Um, we actually had Lacey on, and, and about a month out, she had um, like a, like a serious incident happen with her health, and she had to drop out. And at that point, we were already like over halfway done with all of our outfits, and I had actually started some of the work on Lacey on for this person. So just be prepared for the unexpected, and know that if you have a group member uh, <coughs> drop out, maybe you'll need to send a new audio to the comp competition and, and pull out their audio. Or maybe we could, what we did is we called Lacey on's name, looked around, and we're like, I guess she forgot she was late and we made a joke about her car running down or something. So sometimes you can also play it off as that we did this on purpose. This person has actually not was never going to be here. So just don't expect everyone to make it um, and have a backup plan in case they can't. Yeah. Also, um, the first photo, photo I put in there is because sometimes you get hilarious groups where you're all walking to judging and someone's like, can you get a photo of me? If you can catch my wall, I'm moving. And that's what happened. And she's like halfway, like still getting dressed. And mm -hmm. I think someone was tying up the, your, your lace, your corset behind you or yeah. something, but it was, it was really funny. Um, so reasons to compete. Well, I mentioned funny photos. I'm kissing my weapon there. I don't even remember kissing my weapon on stage. Was this hilarious? So they got this photo and I'm like, did I do that? And she's like, yeah, you did. I'm like, man, I, sometimes you get on stage, you do, you do your skit, your performance, you're like, wait, I did do that? Okay, so you kind of get to create new memories that you may have missed because you were so nervous to get everything done. And those stage lights can be bright sometimes, it can be hot sometimes, the crowd can be really loud. There are moments where you may not even hear your audio very well, so you're just going off of sheer memory. <laughs> so, I, I think that's almost one of the good things about mm -hmm. it, but also kind of the tough things is generally speaking, it depends on the location, but usually those lights are so bright you can barely see the audience, and that's good because it's less intimidating to not see all those people, but it's also not so good because you you can't like see how their reaction is if, if what you're doing like resonates with them or not. Um, uh, but I think it's definitely less than a lot of people think. They're thinking they're going to just see a sea of people and really you're going to see a sea of black because <laughs> yes. the lights are on you and it's super it's dark. Super dark. dark. And so you'll want to also consider when you are going on stage, um, I, one thing I forgot to talk about is do they have stairs or ramps? Some places do not have ramps, so if you are in a costume that requires a ramp or you have accessibility um, issues where you need a ramp, typically we will take you in front of the stage to the judges and they'll have a remote cameraman uh, following you so you can see stuff. But if there's not a remote cameraman, just understand that you're going to have the judges in half of the front row and, and like not as many people see you. So it's they're getting much better about accessibility, but some of the smaller cons are still kind of trying to gear up for that. Um, another thing, another reason to compete um, is the friends you make. I, 
I'd say most of the last one which should I now have is an adult one because I made them in a green room. So seriously. Yeah. yeah. And I mean I've met I mean in green rooms I've met amazing photographers taking background photos. Uh, green rooms are how I got some of my sponsorships for materials because someone was interested to know how I made my armor the way I did. Uh, you will make the most unexpected network connections while competing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had one connection made for a media. Someone was uh, with the news, they took a photo, and then they contacted me later through an email saying, hey, I saw this part of your biography. I didn't know you worked in cybersecurity. I know it's not cosplay related, but would you be willing to like let me interview you about cybersecurity? And I'm like, whoa, did you not even make that connection happen? <laughs> but you, you, you are allowed to enter a little bit about yourself in a lot of these competitions. Depending on what you enter, it might intrigue a reporter, and they might just reach out to you. Stuff like that can happen. Yeah. Um, also, you know, if, you're, if you really, really like it, they, they do um, give you money. <laughs> so you can invest it in your next project. <laughs> Gosh, he's a dust trying to kill you. Yeah, man. I was fine the first half of this. So uh, we've got in-state versus out-state. So the two things that are most important for in-state is it's a lot easier to meet up with all the people, right? If you're doing a group, it's a lot easier to find everyone. If you're in-state, your own state building something, you probably know where everything's located. You probably know what resources to use. And then also, you probably know where to go take photos and things. Uh, so location, you've got a lot, of, a lot going to your advantage. Whereas when you're out of state, you are subject to the conditions of that convention and whatever their rules are. So this is me competing at LA Comic Con. And don't forget what will fit in your car slash luggage. <laughs> oh yeah. My luggage is overweight this past con. I apologize for the way I took this video. My phone, not the best camera, but I had to move for my girl. Yeah. <laughs> So you can see the stage here isn't very big. We were only allowed to pose. There was no skit. Some allowed skits, some don't. Um, they're talking over me while while, uh, while I'm on stage. So I could barely hear anything because the singers were just really, really loud. Um, and uh, this is probably one of the most unusual because it's a national championship. And I expected it to be so much different, but it was like you get you hit these three axes. You, you need to do something in front of the judges and you need to get off stage. And can you need help getting off stage? They actually had this like little elevator. It was so cute. <laughs> people uh, on off. Yeah. Except for one time the elevators got stuck because someone's bad fell in it, so then they had to go fix it and they got it off. Um, plus the thing is about this one, most competitions you go and you get judged and then they give you a call time. With this one, they give us a call time as well, but we had to keep this ugly badge attached to us the entire day. If you lost this little clippy badge, you were immediately disqualified. Really weird to me. I was like, why wouldn't you just put a sticker on my badge? That would be easier to know, hey, I'm actually supposed to be. And it's because in the backstage area, there were celebrities there. So, I mean, big name celebrities were using that backstage area. Do you need water? Oh, do you need water? I'll go run and grab the water. Oh, Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay. Do you need water? It, it gets not too much trouble. Yeah, no, no. We had people from like uh, the um, Shang-Chi and the uh, the Rings were in the back, and like, so there were people walking back and forth there, and the cosplayers were the only ones that were also allowed to be backstage, which is why they were like, you have to keep this bag, your security's gonna be like, no, you can't come back here. And I did not expect that, and not to walk out, and like, dude, was that, wait, what? <laughs> So yeah, at some of those national ones, they use that area for a lot of staging and different things. Yeah, and I think the overall arc of all this is every con is different. Yeah. Even when they're like in the same, like we've been to, you know, multiple anime cons, multiple comic cons, you know, like even like even when they're in the same genre, they can be very different from yes. each other. So talking about very different is competition level. So there's a difference between regional, national, and international. Um, we do have a note here. Please contact the cosplay or costume coordinator of the event if you're not sure what category you belong in. Um, again, some of them, if you haven't made your phone own outfit, they will allow you to enter a fashion show or a skit contest if you're more performance-based or you want to do more modeling. Um, most of the costume contests I've been to have been a minimum of 50%. Uh, the higher, that's typically regional or local levels. The more national levels you get to, it's typically 65 to 85%. And, and international is like, it has to be 85% made. 
So here are some things that, in my experience, I've found are kind of the rule of thumb of what category you should be in. If you are a first-time competitor and you have less than three, uh, I'd say three wins, uh, then you can probably stay a novice on the national and international level. Uh, if you have less than two wins on a local level, you can probably stay a uh, novice, but if you've gone above that, you need to move into either an intermediate or journeyman level. And then intermediate and journeyman is typically, I believe it's like one to three or one to two for local. It varies in Arizona, but it's usually one to two or one to three times that you've won a journeyman award. And then you have to level up. And national, it's always three to four, just because the national and international skills have anywhere from 75 to 150 people in that competition, and that does not include the groups. That's just how many entries there are. So that means there's a lot more you're competing against, and it might be harder for you to achieve that win. Um, once you have passed locally in Arizona, there tends to be a level called advanced. It's not quite master, it's not quite journeyman, it's a little bit in between somehow, and you do need just a couple wins to overcome that. Now, masters is for anybody who has placed in novice and journeyman and are not a professional. So if you've had, you know, if you placed in novice three times, you placed in journeyman three times, you should absolutely be in a master level, no matter what you feel like your skill set is. You've won too many awards, you've won six awards now, you need to be in a master level. Um, unless, of course, you're a professional. Uh, more and more cons are coming up with a professional level. So individuals who make a living off of creating costumes or some form of props or something associated with costuming or cosplay, they are required to enter in a professional level. Yeah, and additionally, um, I mean, we all hope to get here and we won't all get here, but if you end up having sponsorship or donations from, you know, if like some sort of video, GoFundMe, whatever, um, again, something you definitely want to double check in the rules because sometimes it's allowed, yeah. sometimes it's not. You definitely at least want to like the word disclose about that because if you don't and they find out about it later, it's sometimes people get the word that I used for Yojimbo was sponsored by CosplaySupplies.com. Now, because they weren't compensating me, they just gave me a new material because they didn't know how the material could be used. They came up with this new thermal plastic that had this mesh inlay in it that was a lot different than anything Wonderflex had come out with. It was, it was kind of, it was, oh my gosh, it's, I cannot tear it. I've tried tearing it. I've done crazy things with this and I cannot tear it. It has to be super cool and cut, but it stretches so far. Um, and they were like, well, can you do this? What can you make with this? Well, let's try a couple different things. Um, so I made blue armor, and I made shoulder pauldrons, and I made ears, and I used it to interface things. I mean, I have yet to find something it can't be used for, um, which is pretty cool. But that also meant that I had to check and make sure that my level was still okay. And they said, yeah, well, that's fine, because you're not being compensated for it. When you're being compensated for it, like the materials, and then you're being paid to to produce some kind of tutorial content, you usually have to get yourself above the level or use a professional status. All right. So, no, we can talk about that now. Okay, cool. Um, I almost forgot about that. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, uh, choosing your audio definitely does matter. Um, like, even in cons that allegedly are zero percent on performance. Performance still matters. Well, like, family so friendly too, like the type of verbiage or language you're allowed to have um, in them. Um, it's been my experience both participating in and just watching and recording and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, either something that's really funny or really heartwarming or touching, those kind of things tend to um, you know resonate more with people. People like tend to like that stuff more. But I really like to warn people against relying on the audio of your skit to portray that it's funny or to portray that it's like a touching sad moment it needs to be your performance because the audio isn't always the best sometimes it's blown out sometimes or, it's, or, quiet, or it's, it's a, a thousand person ballroom and only maybe 500 of the people can actually hear the audio they can see the video but they may not be able to get the audio and uh, the less of an inside to that particular genre that joke is the better as well because It'll probably be hilarious to you knowing the particular show, genre, or whatever, but not everybody's going to get that even among the judges. Um, so something that's like, you know, if you want to make it funny, make it funny with your actions, not just those words. Because then even if the audios, occasionally they just feel like, yeah, we lost everybody's audio files, so we're just going to play some random clip for you. Um, you can still, and then uh, same thing with like, something dramatic, like when we won with the Magic Knight Rayers, mm -hmm. 
that we were showing earlier. Um, we did a thing where uh, the character I was was like praying for the safety of the other ones, and so I just made this like it's a very dramatic. old niche anime that not many people have seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not one of the ones that was that's popular with yeah. kids now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but we still got a lot of people just because we were able to act it out, so you didn't have to we know what that was. So we just had like this wind field. sound, and we, when we came on stage, we acted like we were being blown, and like th- we were like throwing our old cases, like we are in some kind of a little tornado, and then we stopped right next to her, and she was like, oh, you're here. And it was the way the time of the was up was unintentionally funny. <laughs> it's like, oh, finally, yeah, yeah it took so long. Yeah, but again, like, just don't. Get good audio, try to have that ready, be prepared that sometimes they'll lose it, sometimes nobody can hear what the words are, um, sometimes they'll start playing it, like, some places will wait until you're on stage to start playing it, some places will start playing it the second your foot touches the edge, so, so you have to send, like, a cue. Yeah, um, and just just be prepared for weird things to happen with the audio and have that. Yes. And, and some some will actually let you do a dress rehearsal. Not all of them, but most of the time, you're not allowed to rehearse at all. So you don't even know what the stage looks like till you get behind the green room and you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> like one year we went to Taiyukan and we were used to having a large kind of like a stage similar to this. It was half the step, and there were eight of us. We got we, we improvised real quick. <laughs> and we're like, if you're going to take three steps forward, not like ten feet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there are things that you have to improvise sometimes. And then one other thing, since we're talking about audio, do think about um, what, if it's copyrighted or not. A lot of conventions are now beginning to stream their um, performances online. And sometimes they're willing to pay royalties, other times they're not. So you might have them come back to you saying, hey, I like the voiceover that you're doing, but you can't use the melody underneath. Can you change it to something else? Mm-hmm. So. We're running in the last like eight and a half minutes here, so we just kind of talk about our cosplay journey. This is the first costume I ever wore to like a fashion show. I um, actually came to the con just planning to wear the costume, and I walked by a hallway, and Easley's, which used to be a costume shop in Arizona, came up to me and was like, oh my gosh, we're doing a fashion show, you need to come in. And I was like, okay, well, what time is it? And I was like, all right, it's only like three minutes, I'll come. So I get in, I get signed up, I kind of learn more about the people backstage who had done other things, and then I walk, I just walked up and down, and I was really nervous. I like, mm-hmm. this was the first time I even wore a freaking costume. I was like, what's going yeah. on? First time she makes a costume, but she makes that. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> this is, <yeah. laughs> and I won $500 in Easy's credit because they didn't tell me it was judged. Because <laughs> after I come out, I get all these questions, and I'm like, oh, I must just be curious. No, I didn't realize this with the judges asking me questions after I'd gotten off the stage. And then I'm getting ready to leave. She's like, oh, no, no, wait, wait, wait for awards. And I'm like, oh, there's so awards? Okay, I, I want to see who won. It's like, there are a lot of really good people. And I won. And I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, I, this was. This is great. I mean, this is how being held on with like bubble gum and prayers. Because um, I had no idea how to do attachments at this point in time. I had tons of like rope tying me into this and I had welts all over my body. But I guess it was worth it. <laughs> so sometimes the unexpected is fun. And then our next novice award, our first novice award, was at a con named Kama, a Mesa Comic Media Expo that sadly died since now. Um, and we did this Teen Titans skit where they're making fun of Jinx. And it's uh, Starfire and Raven laughing because she's in jail. And then they decide, you know what, why don't we? And I was like, well, we could have more fun than laughing. I mean, what? We had a girl's night out, and the way that I made it look like I ripped out of the, the shackles made the judges laugh so hard because I ripped out and then I go like this, and like Raven came up behind me, put her hand back, and was like, Yeah, I got her. It was just really funny. Yeah. Um, and it was, again, going back to my thing is like, you, didn't, you don't have to know who these yeah. characters are, you don't have to know a thing about anything. You could still tell, like, okay, she's in shackles, and then she broke out, she got stopped. Like, Context, you can figure it out even. And we didn't even have shackles at this point in time. I was like, I'm just gonna pretend like I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I was pretending like they were like underneath my sleeves because they were so long. But um, our next one was uh, I went from novice, like I said, I never want to train in. I went from novice to advanced. Okay. And I was like, scary. <laughs> And so I went advanced at Tucson Comic Con, um, and then I moved on to do more competing serialists. I really, well, I get, I have terrible stage fright. 
it's really weird. I'm fine sitting here in a panel talking to people, but you ask me to perform on stage and I just shut down. So what saved me were the people in the green room. They were just amazing and it, it calmed my nerves so much that I get on stage and I have no problems. And so I was just always more excited to see people in the green room than being on stage. <laughs> Um, but I did place a judges award for this one. Um, apparently, they wanted to give me uh, a, a second place, but there, there was like this year they had like 120 entries. There were so many people. There was such good competition, um, and I was like, well, don't worry about it. Like I don't necessarily come here for the awards. But the one judge pulled me aside after the competition, and she's like, I really enjoyed your mitered edges. And that's when I learned I had mitered an edge. I did not know what that was. <laughs> she's like, wait, you don't know what that is? Like no. Can you show me on the costume that would be? <laughs> I just, I just, all I did was following the sewing encyclopedia and it told me how to create these really nice clean edges and I did not know they were called minor edges. <laughs> so, so you learn. And then we already mentioned the Magic Night Raiders where it was extremely humorous. Plus, those are supposed to be eighth graders. The outfits they're wearing, this was supposed to be eighth graders all in anime. <laughs> so we made, we made jokes about like, Oh wow, an eighth grader was like. Yeah. <laughs> There's always the one. Real <laughs> um, And then more recently, we've done, um, we did get a judges award at Taiyukong for our group because once again, our performance was so humorous that the judges really wanted to give us an award. And finally, I placed a second in journeyman at LA Comic Con at a national championship because I spoke, I wasn't placing for a long time, I spoke to a master competitor and she was like, hey, just because you won advance to that one local con, you should not be competing in master level yet. You're actually, you're causing yourself to, to compete at a detriment because you're still learning your skill set. She's like, I, I recommend you to journeyman at national levels and see what happens. And I did, and I actually talked to the judges about that too. And they're like, yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're fine. You're, Journeyman, you don't have any journeyman under your belt. You have one novice award under your belt. What are you doing? I'm like, well, um, my cosplay career that I didn't even plan to make a career exploded. Um, and I don't know how. <laughs> that might well, not be her cost costume. <laughs> <laughs> but just be prepared for costuming. Sometimes the most obscure thing can just launch you in the competition circuit, okay? and you never know what it might be. Mm -hmm. But we're coming down to the last three minutes, so we're going to leave room for any questions. It does not have to be competition related, but if you have any, please let us know. We've done more competitions than what I showed there. We, uh, I think we've competed in 15 or 16 competitions, mm -hmm. so we have done a lot more than what was shown. And um, so we've done 15 or 16 competitions, and I've won, combined with one, six awards, seven, seven awards, yeah. So you don't always win. So don't think you're going to go in there running every time. So I think it's like a 50 50 chance every time you compete that you might place in some kind of an award. I like to say, you know, I, I competed at Tucson Comic Con and they were the judges. Yeah. And they were awesome judges. Uh, I really enjoyed the green room and enjoyed the pre judging and everything. And, you know, I didn't win anything, but I again, I'm not there to win. I'm there to just enjoy being on stage. Yeah, and that's what I always and, recommend. And it was it was great people. having you as judges. You know, someone I, you know we've and known you since you started. <laughs> yeah, and which is funny because like like they have more costume experience than I did. Now I'm like, why do I keep getting invited to like I'm judging Phoenix Fan Fusion again this year, and I'm going to be sponsoring Tucson again this year, and I have been invited to a convention in Canada, and I've never been to Canada, and I don't know how they freaking found me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I'm doing a uh, Pinticon in Penticton. Oh, so yeah. I have never heard of this before. Uh, I, and I know it's probably going to be smaller because I'm like, I don't think a big, but I did have an invitation for Montreal Comic Con to speak. So they want me to be a speaker. And I'm like, I, unfortunately, the timing this year interferes with something else I have going on. But I was like, hey, let me know for next year because I just Montreal is a fun, fun, fun ass convention. Yeah. It's, it's, and it's, the new site is laid out better. Okay. So it's not so. It, like claustrophobic? Yeah, the old, the, uh, the, the, the old convention center that they were at was much smaller for the crowd that's there. That's there. The, yeah. Well, and the old pictures I see looked huge. It's so, fairly yeah. big. Yeah. But it's very well laid out and they're very, um. Uh, this word timing, timing. Oh, oh, they're yeah. very good on making sure that things run on time. time that's nice. Not all cons are like that at all. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and 
to the point that sometimes they can be kind of mean, but it's because they're trying to keep things on. on, on yeah. Kind. I yeah. I've gone to it several times. It, that sounds because I live. Reached yeah. out to me because I have an uncle that lives out there, and he's like, "Hey, come stay with me." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I guess I'll have to do that next year, though, because um, we I, I have to go in 2020, guys. We bought the plane tickets. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I've had the invitation to speak in 2020, and then yeah, um, <laughs> Montreal is a really, really fun convention. All right, well, have to try. Fan Expo in Canada, in Toronto. Mm-hmm. It's not. Okay. I mean, it's fun, but it's like it's overwhelming we can do a few years <laughs> it's, it's just <laughs> plus you're in downtown Toronto so it's like you know here in Soda it's like different, different yeah yeah that makes sense it's like Seattle <laughs> um, but yeah no thank you all for joining us for a panel if you have any questions let us know I hope you guys have fun the rest of your con all the best con so. and you all look incredible I love all the unique ways that you're interpreting steampunk it's really cool oh yeah, yeah. It's so diverse. I love it. Yeah, like, so you so you're writing a worldview more than a, I think, than a, a, a genre. specific genre or period. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. really need to. I really need to do that panel, but I think I need other people. To help the steampunk like, worldview. Yeah. Yes. Look, look, look steampunk look throughout you. the ages, <laughs> like okay. different eras and stuff like that. Uh, that yeah. I've I've gotten in, in flame wars with people over that particular <laughs> comment. <laughs> Hey, you know what? It's okay. I mean, everybody's interpretation is different, but mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. There's people think the world is flat. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what you guys said earlier is we had somebody come in here earlier and be like, you know, drug queens aren't allowed here. And we're like, say what? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, and then, and then the convention staff very politely walked him up, and we were all like, what? <laughs> so like, what are you even talking about, man? Like, so that was, uh, that was an interesting uh, introduction to my morning. <laughs> I'm like, are you calling me a drug queen? Yeah, I make up a point. <laughs> <laughs> that was and, last night. And I'm going to give a pop for them. They do a every Sunday web broadcast called Cos Talk Live, and they mm-hmm. get wonderful guests, lots yeah. of great information. You're taking a break. Always watching them. Yeah, it's just a pair of difference for me, so I always yeah. miss it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I live on the East Coast. Oh, that, oh, that makes sense. sense. We have yeah. them on YouTube, though, so if you just have, like, one in particular topic you're interested in, you can, like, go through Oh, YouTube they've also had Madame Mesquieu a couple times. Madame Mesquieu, you've had Madame Mesquieu yeah. a couple yeah. times. Oh, she's so awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. She's so hilarious, Thank too. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to have you here. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.